This is Aiden from Mysteries Ahoy, and today I'm talking about one of my favourite caper films, 1966's How to Steal a Million. I should probably begin by saying that How to Steal a Million is first and foremost a romantic comedy. There are large crime elements to the story, and it all revolves around a heist that they're going to pull off in the second act. So the focus is on light romantic banter, and the spectacular scenery of Paris. The way I like to do these videos is to find five elements that I think are particularly memorable or important about the film. So let's begin with number one, the concept. The concept of this film is hilarious. The Binet family are renowned across the world as some of the greatest art collectors. They have a collection that includes Renoir and Van Gogh and hundreds of other fantastic works of art all lost pieces that no one knew about. The problem is they're all fake, and the way that Bonet has been able to build up this legend about himself is based around one statue, the Cellini Venus. Now his own grandfather faked this statue, and it's been sat in their home in pride of place for people to see for a hundred or so years. Everyone who visits prizes it, wants it, wants to put it on display or own it. It's always been refused. It's a fake, but because he owns this renowned piece, everyone assumes that everything else in his collection is real. Shortly after the film begins, we discover that Charles Bonnet has arranged to lend the statue to a museum. It's going to be in pride of place, and he thinks that this is a low-risk proposition. He's not looking to sell the piece, he isn't charging the museum anything. They will have no interest in checking his provenance and it will merely be another way that he can enjoy his supremacy over the art community. While the museum didn't require an inspection prior to putting the work out on display, it turns out that their insurance company is very keen to make sure that their million dollar statue is actually what it says it is. The statue is going to be inspected by the greatest art experts in the world, the guys who invented all of the tests and suddenly the prospect arises that they may very well find themselves headed to prison. Charles's daughter Nicole, though, thinks she has a solution. A few days earlier, she had caught a man prowling around their art collection, trying to inspect the Van Gogh. She decides that she will ask him if he can help steal this statue from the museum. And so this is the concept. A person is trying to steal their own statue from a museum. They're not going to receive any money as a result of this because they already own the statue. The insurance policy isn't activated until that insurance inspection takes place. And so the question is, how will they breach the seemingly impregnable defences put up around the statue? This brings me to the second thing I love about the film, its presentation of the work of the art forger. There is a fantastic sequence very early in this film where we follow Nicole as she goes up the stairs and goes through the secret door hidden in a wardrobe in her bedroom and it takes her up into the attic. And in the attic, her father, Charles Bonnet, is hard at work. He is creating an original Van Gogh. We get to see him as he's working. And so we get to see some of the tricks he's employing to make his original creation look like it might be the work of a grand master. Bonet's approach is quite simple. He's going to make people want his work by refusing to sell it to them. He's going to put it on display in his living room, knowing that all of the art collectors who are visiting Paris are bound to visit him at some point. They'll try and persuade him, and perhaps a year, maybe 10 years down the line, he'll finally agree to part with that piece when he needs the money. He gets to look like a benevolent collector, someone who really is disinterested in the, the grubby money of the art collection game. At the same time, he benefits. It's all about creating demand and refusing supply. It's clever, it's funny, and it's well observed. I similarly really enjoy the sequence in which we see him finally agree to lend his statue to the museum. We get to see him take it down off the pedestal and hand it with reverence to the director of the museum. It's a gloriously funny scene, 
made all the more amusing by the way that Hepburn is desperately trying to get hold of the statue for herself, presumably so that she can damage it in some way, to do anything to prevent her father making this reckless choice of putting it on display in public. This all brings me to the third thing. The centerpiece of any heist movie has to be the heist itself, and the one in How to Steal a Million is truly memorable. It all starts with a really fun sequence in which we see Peter O'Toole leading Audrey Hepburn around the museum. We see him noticing little details, but he never really tells us what he has in mind. The viewer has to try and anticipate what he will be doing. The plan is truly audacious. In fact, later on, the O'Toole character is surprised it worked at all. It is really creative and it uses all of these elements in unexpected ways. Now, I'm not sure that every element of the plan would work, but it is really fun to see how he's going to get her through the various steps they need to get into the building, to get their hands on the statue, and to make it out without being caught. We also get to spend quite a lot of time with the guards, and we focus really on two actors, Jacques Moran, who had been in Charade with Hepburn, and will really be a familiar face to anyone who's seen any films from this period of cinema. He was one of Hollywood's favourite French actors. And then you also have an actor called Moustache. Now, when you see the film, you'll know exactly who he is. He is really there as comic relief. He has this big moustache, just like his name implies, and he's drinking all the way through. So he is perhaps a less complex and interesting character, but I enjoy their interplay and their frustration as it builds throughout the heist. I love the way as well that the plan really uses their psychology and plays off people's natural and human instincts in unusual or testing situations. Everything feels very well thought out in that regard. So even if I'm not sure that every piece of the technology would work the way that it's being shown to, I really do enjoy the sequence, and I think it is gorgeous to look at. Now, at the start of this video, I mentioned that it is primarily a romantic comedy, and when it comes to the romance of it all, this film does not disappoint. The chemistry between Audrey Hepburn and Peter O'Toole is really fantastic. I love the way the two play off each other, and the fantastic banter of the script. There are so many opportunities for comedy, for um, moments of attraction, that you really do get a sense that these two people have been thrown together and do come to like each other a lot by the end of the film. Personally, I happen to consider this to be Hepburn's last great film role. A year later, she would retire from acting and take a break for about eight or nine years before making a comeback in Robin and Marion. Now that film has moments of charm, but it definitely shows her in a different phase of her career. Fashion connoisseurs will adore the way she's dressed throughout this film, though there is this wonderful moment where Peter O'Toole gets to tease her and places her in this outfit which is very dowdy and a necessary step towards his plan. I also really enjoy the little red sports car she drives around. It's tiny, it's very chic, and it sums up her character perfectly. Peter O'Toole, on the other hand, is towards the beginning of his film career, and here he is charming, he's playful, he has a twinkle in his eye, and he is similarly gorgeously attired. The pair sparkle, they have huge chemistry, and it all comes together in a fantastic sequence in which they are trapped together inside the museum. One of the things that for me defines this film is the idea that these two actors are having enormous fun on screen, and I do believe it all comes over for the viewer. The fifth and final element of this film that I'd like to draw your attention to is the performance of Hugh Griffith as the forger, Bonet. Griffith's Bonet is a larger-than-life creation in every respect, from the way he is costumed in this dapper series of suits and dressing gowns, spraying himself with elaborate perfumes. He is the embodiment of the art world. While Griffith's Bonet is primarily a comical creation, there are some moments of tenderness in the portrayal as well, particularly towards the character of his daughter. We get to see him caring for her, observing her, and coming to the realisation that maybe there might be a guy on the scene 
that she may be interested in. I do love, though, the punchline that this film gives him. And to me, it leads out on a truly memorable note. It reminds us that however much he may want to change, he remains a rascal at heart. He is a great creation. He is a heap of fun. And he works because the other characters are more grounded in the romantic sensibility. He's allowed to go off and hit the comedic high notes. So those are just a few of the reasons that I would recommend that you watch How to Steal a Million. As I say, it is not a conventional crime film. It is more a crime-themed film, but it is really fun, has great performances, and it is just a romp. If you like the film Charade, you'll also enjoy this. The two have a lot in common. And if you enjoy either of the two leads, they're both on top form here. If you have seen the film, I would love to know what you think. Please leave a comment below, and I will see you next time.